This video is a demonstration of our Apple Inc. earnings model. The format is consistent with our others. In the upper left hand corner we have the color legend. It tells you that anywhere you see a blue cell, those represent our Gutenberg estimates. Purple cells represent company guidance and orange cells represent consensus estimates. Below that you have the summary of our price earnings based valuation and our discounted cash flow based valuation. Um, then we get to the income statement. For underneath that we have the segment details, a balance sheet, cash flow statement, which are collapsed right now, but you can expand by hitting the plus on the side. And you have the multiple valuation section and our discounted cash flow valuation section. So you can see that we have some of the periods shaded in dark gray. Those represent the historic values. And then the light gray sections represent um, our forecasts for future periods. As you go through, you'll see some comments in here. Those represent management guidance. So we've calibrated our model to be consistent with um, consensus estimates. But obviously, that consensus esti estimate might vary to some extent from what management has already guided to. So if you go to Apple's um, investor relations page, you go to scroll down on the, the last press release, and you'll see where they gave guidance. So you see Apple is providing the following guidance for fiscal 2015 fourth quarter, revenue between 49 billion and 51 billion. So if the consensus estimate varies from this, we just want to put the comment so you're aware of what management said it would be. So you can see here we have 49 to 51 billion. And in this, for this quarter, the consensus represents the high end of that guidance. So we're going to freeze the frames here, and we'll see where this model varies a bit from some of our others. And that for that you go down to the segment details and you can see we've we've added some of the sections that um, Apple actually reports each quarter so you have sales by geography if you'd like that detail for future periods we're just taking the same percentage um, that we've seen historically and applying it across the board but it's not really driving our earnings what's driving our earnings is the unit and average selling price of each one of their products so if you expand the product sections, you can see that we have pretty much everything here. Um, one thing that you'll notice is we have some Gutenberg estimates here for iWatch and accessory um, and other revenue. And that's because they don't disaggregate, for right now at least, they're not disaggregating the iWatch sales from the other sales. So this, even though it's a historic period, still represents an estimate. Uh, so this is the revenue section by product. Below that you have units sold. And again, iWatch still represents our estimate. We don't really know how many iWatch units they sold last quarter. Uh, and then we have the average selling price by product. <clears throat> okay, so now let's get into how we're actually driving the earnings, what, what we're doing to drive the earnings here. When you get this model downloaded, you probably want to stick to just the blue cell. So for the fourth quarter, if you wanted to change the revenue number, how would you do that? You see all of these cells represent equations. So you don't want to change those because then it's going to break down the integrity of the model. But you do want to change these. So let's say right now we're estimating that the iPhone average selling price is $625 per unit. And we're estimating that the iPhone growth rate is 7.9 percent. When you input those values with these others, um, average selling prices for all the other products and growth rates for all the other products, you get to the consensus revenue estimate. That doesn't necessarily mean that this is what the consensus um, estimate is by each individual product, but this gets us to our total revenue number. So now let's say that you think management is going to beat this quarter's guidance. Maybe you think that the iPhone growth rate will be much stronger, or maybe you think that the average selling price would be higher. Uh, in this case, we brought it down because they're getting a little further away from um, from the the iPhone 6 launch, but they have the iPhone 6s launch coming up, so that might actually help offset some of the decline in the average selling price. So let's say you want to bump this up to 
uh, $650 per unit and maybe you think the iPhone growth rate is going to be 10%. So you can see up here that the prices have, the share prices actually changed after those two adjustments. So we were at a weighted average of $127 per share and then when we put those two changes on through we got to $129 so an increase in, in $2 per share. And you can see what happened to the revenue number. Uh, it went from $51 billion to almost $53 billion. Let's undo that for now. But you can see how the model is dynamic and it can take your changes and input it in there and calculate what the new earnings are going to be and calculate what the new share price is going to be. And you can see up here that the future income statement is really just dri driving, uh, being driven by what you have in the segment details. So that's where the revenue number comes from. Cost of goods sold is a function of the ratio that you use for gross margin. And management guided that, that number as well. So you can see right now our model before making any changes um, we were at 39.2% to get back to the consensus um, EPS estimate and management has guided to 38.5% to 39.5 so higher end of the range but still within um, within reason and you can see that's what's driving our cost of goods sold number then R&D and SG&A is simply a function of the revenue line so we can see we have it staying pretty much consistent with what we had for the fiscal third quarter. Um, management guided the other income and expenses, but again, we show that model in future periods based on a percentage of total revenue. And then for Apple, for the change in basic and diluted shares outstanding, we use a simplistic approach here. Rather than inputting repurchase dollar amounts, which you can put in here if you'd like, um, we just do a percentage change in both of those those factors. So once you have all of those details, you can then calculate, or the model will calculate, the basic and diluted EPS just based on the segment details. So that gets you to your net earnings model, which we model out for five years. Obviously, the next 12 months represent the most important periods, but you can go out further if you'd like. Um, and for an advanced user, we do have the balance sheet and the cash flow statement down below there. So if you click to expand the balance sheet, you can see that a number of these balances we have highlighted in blue because it's just too difficult to forecast into future periods like deferred tax asset and vendor non-trade receivables. So we simply set them for the time being to the ending balance of the prior quarter. The ones that we focus on are accounts receivable, inventories, and accounts payable. And the reason is that we use those three metrics in our discounted cash flow. Those are the um, primary accounts in working capital. And so for that reason, they impact the discounted cash flow valuation. So then below the balance sheet, you can see that we have a couple of operational ratios that help help us forecast what those three balances are going to be. So you have the inventory turnover, um, and you can see in historic periods, we calculate it as the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory balance. And then if we set that close to what it was before, we follow some seasonality trends. Um, we can then use that value to calculate the inventory balance in future periods. So we, we're taking um, cost of goods sold divided by our, our inventory turnover ratio um, times two because we're using an, an average balance and subtracting the, the previous period's inventory balance. So we have a similar type of calculation for accounts receivable and accounts payable. Uh, then from there the equity section is linked to the earnings through retained earnings. So you can see that this that's what this equation is doing. The, the balance in retained earnings is equal to um, the net earnings, which we're actually showing in the cash flow statement. 
and we subtract out from that the dividends per share times the shares outstanding, which represent distributions from re retained earnings. Below the balance sheet, we have the cash flow statement. And if we expand that, we can see that, again, there's a number of cash flow related items that are just too difficult to model out and really don't have too much of an impact on share valuation anyway. So you'll see a number of blanks in the future periods. But we are including the main items, accounts receivable, inventories, accounts payable, and then the remaining changes in the balance sheet are incorporated here. And then obviously this links back to the balance sheet because the cash at the end of the period uh, represents the cash balance on the balance sheet. You'll also notice at the bottom of the cash flow statement that we have the free cash flow. We have the net cash per share, the free cash flow, and discounted free cash flow. So this five-year period represents um, our first stage in our discounted cash flow valuation. So we're summing up the discounted cash flows for each one of those periods before we enter our terminal stage in our discounted cash flow valuation. And that's at the very bottom below the multiple section. If you expand the discounted cash flow, you can see here there are a number of inputs into this discounted cash flow valuation. Um, we have a calculation of the equity market risk premium. Um, we've got some metrics about the um, capital structure of the company and our weighted average cost of capital. Below that we get to our constant growth stage, um, which is what we're using for our terminal value. And that's what helps us get to our final share price. So if you want more details on the discounted cash flow valuation, we have a 10 minute video that goes through each one of these. So visit our YouTube channel or our website to uh, find that. And above the discounted cash flow valuation is the simple multiple. So we're using, we're taking the three month average next 12 month price earnings multiple. From that, we subtract out our net adjusted cash per share. So for Apple, it's a little bit different than some of the other companies because a large portion of their cash balance sits in overseas accounts. And if they were to repatriate those funds back to the United States, they'd have to pay a tax on it. So that's what this equation is trying to compensate for. If you say, approximately 89% of the balance remains offshore and you multiply it by one minus their effective tax rate that gives you a uh, loose approximation for what the after tax value of the cash balance would be and then we add that back to um, to the share valuation here so all this is doing is taking our multiple that we're using which is close to the um, three month average for next 12 month EPS estimate consensus EPS estimate plus the four EPS estimates for the next four quarters. So this one, this one, this one, and this one. And then we're just adding back cash. And that gets us to our multiple price target of $117. If you'd like to download this model, please visit our website, gutenbergresearch.com. Uh, from the homepage, you can click on the model store and then scroll down to find the Apple model here and then just click the buy now option thanks for watching